Tonight, millions at risk for severe storms after a violent and deadly tornado outbreak in the Midwest. Massive twisters ripping through seven states, throwing debris thousands of feet in the air. At least three people killed and dozens of others hospitalized. Daylight revealing widespread destruction. Homes reduced to rubble. Tonight, 17 million people from Texas to Florida at risk for hail, destructive winds, and tornadoes. Bill Karens is standing by to time it out. Also tonight, Willis survives. A Georgia judge ruling DA Fonnie Willis can stay on the election interference case against former President Donald Trump. It comes just before the special prosecutor, who she had a romantic relationship with, handed in his resignation. A move the judge said was necessary in order for Willis to stay on the biggest case of her career. The judge's harsh words on what he calls her lapse in judgment. This as New York, a New York judge rather, grants a delay in Trump's hush money trial. We'll explain where all of his cases stand. Putin's power play, presidential elections underway in Russia, but it is no surprise who will win. Pockets of resistance, no match for Putin, as he is sure to sweep a fifth term. We're inside a polling center in Moscow as the Kremlin goes to great lengths to prove his country is behind him. Subway shooting scare, terrifying moments as a fight erupts on a train and ends with one man shot. The chaotic and frightening scene as panicked riders rush to take cover. How police are responding to this latest incident amid a surge of violence on the subways. Plus, model and actress Cara Delvine's house engulfed in a massive fire. Her hillside mansion burning for hours overnight, the roof collapsing, and a firefighter sent to the hospital. The actress posting to Instagram fearing for her beloved cats still trapped inside. And security guard surprise, a college security guard hadn't seen his family in more than a decade, but thanks to a group of dedicated students, that's all about to change. The touching moment that brought the beloved guard to tears. Top Story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Ellison Barber, in for Tom Yamas. The Midwest reeling from a violent and deadly tornado outbreak, and tonight, more states are at risk. Take a look at this, a massive twister tearing across Ohio, sending debris thousands of miles in the air. This tornado, just one of many, ripping through at least seven states. The nighttime twisters prompting a mass casualty response in northwest Ohio, where at least three people were killed. Daylight revealing the widespread devastation there as homes are leveled, neighborhoods left unrecognizable. In Indiana, a monster EF3 tornado ripped through the area, leaving dozens of people hospitalized. A trail of destruction left in its wake as houses and businesses are completely destroyed. Search and rescue crews continue to dig through the rubble for possible victims and the threat far from over with more storms targeting millions from Texas to Florida tonight. Bill Karens is standing by to time it out, but we begin on the ground with NBC's Shaq Brewster. Tonight, a violent start to tornado season, toppling buildings while tearing others apart. Tornadoes ripping through nine states, flipping boats and smashing brick walls, including in Ohio, where the Logan County Sheriff says at least three people were killed. The damage is very, very significant, and it's just quite, it's quite, quite extensive. Search crews spent the day scouring collapsed buildings, traversing down power lines, and bringing in cadaver dogs to search for victims. Many places back there that are collapsed, uh, and we need to go back with heavy equipment to move those to make sure that there's anybody injured back there or possibly deceased. Susan Young was trapped inside this home in Lakeview, Ohio, yelling for help as the storm barreled through. Yeah, it just took our roof and then just blew me down the hall. <laughs> you saw your roof? Yeah fly off. Yeah. What did yeah. you think when you saw that? Help. <laughs> I didn't know if I'd make it. Her entire block devastated. The result of the most active severe weather day of the year so far. More than 300 storms reported nationwide Thursday. We have houses leveled to the ground here. In neighboring Indiana, search and rescue teams are on the ground. Jesse Kirsch is there. Here in Winchester, Indiana, one hospital says it's treated more than two dozen people for injuries, including broken bones. Some businesses and homes here, devastated. 
In Missouri, hail smashed through windshields and battered homes. Experts say the warming climate is leading to more frequent tornadoes happening earlier in the year and further north than usual. On a day many lost everything, Susan tells me it could have been worse. Really glad to be alive because it was, it was scary. And with that, NBC News correspondent Shaq Brewster joins us from Lakeview, Ohio. Shaq, do officials fear the death toll there will continue to rise? Hi there, Allison. Well, that was certainly the case this morning, but this evening, the county sheriff is telling us that the search and rescue mission is complete and that despite the path of destruction that you're seeing, he believes there are no individuals who are currently unaccounted for. And meanwhile, the governor of this state vowing that despite the destruction you see and the businesses destroyed and homes and families displaced, he says that this community, Allison, will be back. Shaq Brewster, thank you. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens joins me now. Bill, I mean, it has been an incredible two days of storms. Where do things stand right now? There's 17 tornadoes now in this outbreak over the last two days. Most of them were last night. Just how widespread they are is pretty incredible. Nine different states from Texas all the way to Ohio. And it's amazing we didn't have more lives lost. And I think one of the important reasons why is that the people in these manufactured homes that were just destroyed. I mean, there's just rows of houses that were destroyed. People left them because they had a good heads up. They had enough lead time to evacuate and get out of harm's way. So this was the line of storms, Winchester, Indiana, and Lake View, Ohio. These are the two hardest hit areas with the manufactured homes. And the tornado warnings went out at about the same time, right around 730. Both of them had about 22 to 24 minutes of lead time. So the alerts went off on their phones. People knew the tornado was coming and they got to safety. Uh, you know, this saved lives because of the job that was done by the National Weather Service. So that's fantastic. Now, as far as what we've dealt with the last 12 hours, strong storms rolled through Louisiana. Now they're at the Florida Panhandle. We still have a lot of nasty weather in areas of Texas, and that'll continue in to the overnight hours. It has been a very difficult evening rush hour around Houston. A lot of big thunderstorms, hail reported with these, not only like damaging hail, but still difficult driving conditions. So one storm's exiting over Houston and a huge storm just to the south there of the Houston area. Look at the lightning strikes with that one. So where do we go from here? Over the weekend, we're still going to have isolated severe storms, not as widespread. Again, looking at South Texas, San Antonio, down the Corpus Christi. And a lot of this mess will be moving along the Gulf Coast this weekend. Rest of the East Coast, West Coast looks fine. Just along the Gulf Coast, Ellison, where they're having the bad weather right now, that's going to return on Sunday. Mm. Bill Karens, thank you. We want to turn now to that other major news we've been following tonight. A Georgia judge ruling that embattled Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis can continue leading the election interference case against former President Donald Trump. But only if the special prosecutor she appointed and had a romantic relationship with steps down. That prosecutor, Nathan Wade, turning in his resignation letter earlier today. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander has been following this case from the beginning and has the latest tonight from Atlanta. He was front and center when Fonnie Willis announced her criminal indictment of Donald Trump. But tonight, Nathan Wade, the man leading the prosecution against the former president for allegedly trying to overturn Georgia's 2020 election results, has resigned. The culmination of a months-long spectacle after one of Trump's co-defendants, Michael Roman, exposed a romantic relationship between Wade and Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis, who hired Wade on the case. Roman accused Willis of financially benefiting from her relationship with Wade after the two went on vacations together while working the case. In a ruling today, Judge Scott McAfee said while he did not find an actual conflict of interest in the case, he did find a significant appearance of impropriety that infects the current structure of the prosecution team and gave Willis an ultimatum. Either she and her office leave the case or Wade. In a letter, Wade writes today he's resigning to move this case forward as quickly as possible. For Willis, today's ruling is a legal victory, but a professional blow following this stunning two-hour testimony. It, it, it is a lot. It is a lot. Judge Scott McAfee scolding what he called her unprofessional manner on the stand. And while not dismissing the case outright, as the defense had asked, McAfee takes Willis to task over, quote, this tremendous lapse in judgment. Tonight, Trump's attorney, Steve Sadow, says he will use all legal options available as we continue to fight to end this case.
Also tonight, Trump's former vice president, Mike Pence, tells Fox News he will not endorse Trump, in part because of his actions on January 6th. Donald Trump is pursuing and articulating an agenda that is at odds with the conservative agenda that, that we governed on during our four years. And that's why I cannot in good conscience uh, endorse Donald Trump in this campaign. Yet another political headwind for a candidate already facing several legal ones. And Blaine Alexander joins us now. So, Blaine, what is next in this case after today's decision? Well, Ellison, a lot of that depends on what the defense attorneys decide to do. They are able to ask for an appeal in all of this, and at least one defense attorney has signaled that that's not an option that's off the table. And so if that's something that happens, we're talking about another few weeks of delays while this process goes through. But in the grander scheme of things, you know, initially Fonnie Willis had wanted a timeline of a trial to start by early August. That was already ambitious before this past two and a half months of motions trying to remove her. But now it seems almost all but impossible that this will tr go to trial before the election. Oh. Allison. Blaine Alexander in Atlanta, thank you. For more on what this case means, or what this means rather for the case itself, I want to bring in NBC News legal analyst and friend of Top Story, Danny Savalo. So Danny, let's just start with the judge's decision here, that point. Judge McAfee, he didn't say everything was good here, also didn't completely upend everything. Were you surprised by the judge's decision? I was not. It was a very Judge McAfee decision based on what I saw during the hearing. Right down the middle, uh, everybody won and everybody lost at the same time. The Fulton County DA's office wins in that it gets to stay on the case. But it loses in that it sure doesn't look good in doing so. And the defense technically wins part of their motion, but a tiny little part of that motion. And even though they've only succeeded in getting rid of one prosecutor, it's a major victory for the defense, in my view, because they do slow down the momentum of the case. Although, if Nathan Wade really billed $800,000 in two years, I really don't think we're going to have that hard a time finding somebody else to take the reins. In fact, I'm applying to the Georgia <laughs> bar as we speak on my phone because apparently everybody's billing $800,000 yeah. a year down there. Uh, so let's talk a little more about Nathan Wade. I mean, is it really disruptive to a prosecutor's or the prosecution's case to have someone who was seemingly very important, kind of one of the main point guys on this case to be gone this late? Yeah, on the one hand, if he is the team leader, then yes, it's very disruptive. But on the other hand, I can't help but wonder, I mean, they have at least one other special prosecutor, maybe more, I don't remember the count. And also the Fulton County DA's office isn't East Ham Sandwich out in the boondocks. It is a major city, hundreds of DA's in that office. There have to be some line prosecutors who can step in and fill out uh, their needs, or they should be able to find someone. And I, I know I was being glib before, but look, at 250 an hour, given what Nathan Wade billed, I don't think the job will be vacant for all that long. But yes, in the sense that everybody's coming to work every day with their lunch pails, getting to work and prosecuting this case, this has been a major disruption. Not even because you have to find a new prosecutor, but think about this. Think about the line prosecutors on this team. At some point, there had to be a conversation, Ellison, where they say, hey, I know you're working on the Brad Raffensperger phone calls on this case. We're going to take you off that and put you on the Fonnie Willis Napa Valley trip. Uh, part of the case, something you never planned on doing as a line prosecutor. Here you are in the case of a lifetime. It can make your career. And frankly, I think we'll find out in a few years that these prosecutors, at least some of them, were pretty irked at the idea that they had to stop working on their case and focus on defending Nathan Wade's divorce interrogatories or whether or not their boss paid cash when uh, the other prosecutor and her went to Belize. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if I were a prosecutor on that team, I would be really frustrated right now. So probably morale is down. They'll find someone to fill uh, Nathan Wade's shoes, but it is a blow. Is this something, uh, some of the issues that the judge raised where he said that Fonnie Willis showed a lapse in judgment, uh, is that something that the defense team, and this is a complicated case, case we're talking about a RICO case with multiple co-defendants, can they bring that back up as this case moves forward? You bring up a really interesting point. At the core of this, none of this motion really goes to the substantive facts of guilt or innocence. The argument is it affects due process. The argument the defense made is that this affects the right to a fair trial. And the appearance of impropriety does relate to that. Maybe not directly, but tangentially. So if it doesn't really affect the underlying facts, I imagine it won't be an issue uh, that really affects 
the substantive guilt as this case proceeds to trial. But in, I mean, I just keep going back to the fact that it's just hugely disruptive. And by the way, like you pointed out, the judge concluded, yes, the DA can stay on the case. Uh, but boy, this is hardly an endorsement of what they did. And I have to, you know, all day I've been working on this over in my head. It's very unusual to get a decision that gives a choice. Mm -hmm. Usually an order is just that. It's an order, thou shalt. It's not, thou shalt make a decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's so interesting to me that this appearance of impropriety, well, either it's the entire office or it's one guy. And that seems like a pretty strange thing. Is it really either the entire office or is this fixed by just getting rid of one guy? Mm -hmm. I'm really not sure. Uh, and this is a strategy we've seen from the Trump team of where they've tried to delay in a number of trials that delay works in their favor, they seem to think, right? And that certainly is one of the arguable wins for them as it relates to what's happened in Georgia right now. But when you're looking at some of the other cases, obviously this is not the only uh, case Trump and his vast legal team are dealing with. Very quickly, what else are you watching on some of those other cases? There are four criminal cases against Trump. Two are federal, two are state. Uh, what a difference delay makes in the federal cases, because if Donald Trump is elected and inaugurated, he can simply get rid of those federal cases. A couple different procedural mm -hmm. ways. The state cases, it's not so easy. But constitutionally, we're not entirely sure what happens if a sitting president, someone, a state prosecutor tries to put him on trial, or worse, tries to imprison him. We just don't know what happens. So delay helps Trump in both state state and federal, more in federal, but maybe also in the state cases. All right, Danny Savalos, thank you so much. We appreciate it. We're going to turn now to the terrifying scene on a New York City subway train. This happened last night. Video from a passenger capturing the moment a fight breaks out before one man was then shot in the head as frightened riders cowered on the other end of the car. Our Stephen Romo has the details and a warning. Portions of this video are difficult to watch. <laughs> Tonight, horror on a New York City subway. Commuters running for their lives after police say a man was shot during a fight on board a moving train. Let me out! This woman, who recorded herself caught in the middle of it all, recalled the terrifying moments before she was helped into an ambulance for treatment. I was screaming myself, then everybody stopped warning me over. He was so shot, I heard. Police say it all started when this 36-year-old man entered a Brooklyn subway station Thursday afternoon during rush hour. About 10 minutes later, that man started an argument with a 32-year-old rider. That quickly escalated into a physical fight. A woman passenger appearing to stab the 36-year-old in the lower back. That man then pulling out a gun, sending panicked passengers running to the other end of the subway car. According to police, the gunman was disarmed by the man he was fighting and shot with his own gun four times, just as the train pulled into the station. That sent commuters into an even bigger frenzy. Officers recovered the gun at the scene and rushed the 36-year-old to the hospital where he's in critical condition. Police detained the shooter at the scene, but the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office saying they are not filing criminal charges, citing evidence of self-defense. Police say the woman who allegedly stabbed the aggressor is not in custody, and they're not saying whether she could face charges. Some witnesses still in shock. People were praying, huddling on top of each other, hugging each other, trying to reassure one another that everything was going to be okay. This all comes just a week after New York Governor Kathy Hochul announced a team of 1,000 National Guard troops and state police officers would help secure the country's most traveled subway system. These brazen, heinous attacks on our subway system will not be tolerated. Police saying riders shouldn't be afraid of taking public transit despite this latest incident. Well, we are keeping a large system and a large amount of people safe. The most recent NYPD figures show that the number of shootings in transit crime both dropped by more than 15 percent in February compared to last year. But some commuters say it's not enough. Honestly, um, it's out of control. NBC News correspondent Stephen Romo joins us now in studio. Stephen, a terrifying scene. I mean, we are both subway riders. This is everyone's worst nightmare. When it comes to those actions Governor Hochul is taking to try and deal with some of the situations happening in the subway, 
What is the public and writers, what do they think about that? Well, there's been a lot of criticism of that decision to put the National Guard in the subway. People are getting their bags checked. It's just some odd to see the National Guard troops down there in the subway system. Some civil rights groups have also raised concerns about the, uh, the bag searches and all of that. But we're only a week into this plan, so it's uh, too early to see exactly if it will help the situation. But it obviously did not prevent what happened last night on the A train. So many people are pointing that out right now and questioning if this really is the answer. All right, Stephen Romo, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Moving overseas now to the presidential election in Russia tonight, where it's a certainty that Vladimir Putin will win yet another six-year term, the longest-serving Russian leader since Stalin, facing only nominal opposition. But across the country, reports of violence at polling places as Russia's war against Ukraine rages on. NBC's chief international correspondent, Keir Simmons, has the latest tonight from Moscow. Tonight, pockets of resistance on the first day of Russia's election. Reports of dye poured into ballot boxes and arson attempts. Here, a Molotov cocktail apparently thrown at a polling station. Russian President Putin is expected to win six more years in power. He voted today on his own, on a computer. In Moscow at 8 a.m., one of the first we saw vote, 90-year-old Nina Kisilova. Telling NBC News she remembers Stalin's funeral and now only trusts Putin. We live well, says Svetlana Kulikova. That's why I voted for Putin. Among many signs the Kremlin wants a big turnout, we witnessed municipal workers employed by the government arriving in groups and text messages seen by NBC News promising prizes to those who vote online. While this election observer told us new electronic voting can't be verified. You cannot know what's happening when someone votes online or electronically. You just don't know, right? Da, da. International election monitors will come from 106 countries, Russia says, including China. But independent Western observers are not welcome. None of the three men running against Putin have criticised him, and none poll higher than 6%, while even this weekend there were only a few campaign posters across Moscow. A Russian bear is the star of a Putin election video on state media. Don't put him in chains, it says. The widow of Alexei Navalny, Putin's most famous critic, who recently died in prison, urging the West not to recognize the ballot. For almost 12 hours today, we've been watching Russians under no illusions what they're being asked to vote for. This V, and it's everywhere, this election, representing the war in Ukraine. The war unrelenting today, with missile and drone strikes against Russia near the Ukrainian border. Putin on television saying the attacks were aimed at disrupting the election but will make Russia more united. Keir Simmons joins us now from Moscow. Keir, we know that despite the fact that the outcome of this election is essentially predetermined, the Kremlin is keeping a very close eye on voter turnout. What are the numbers telling us so far? Oh, yeah, Ellison, turnout is everything. It's what really matters to the Kremlin. And we've heard tonight from Russia's Electoral Commission that it says across Russia, so far today, there's been a 36% turnout. Now, think about that. It's a three-day election. If it was the same numbers tomorrow and then on Sunday, well, that would be an almost 100% turnout. Pretty difficult to believe, right? And just a sense of the size of this country, Ellison, and the difficulty of judging whether this is a free and fair election. It's 11 time zones. While we're talking now, in the far east of Russia, they're already well into their day, well into the second day of voting here. Hmm. And Keir, when Putin wins, which of course he will, he'll become the longest serving leader in Russia since the Russian Revolution. What will the implications be back here in the United States? Well, Alison, to, to state the obvious, what it means when Putin wins and wins another six years after 24 years in power is that there's going to be more Putin, that people hoping that uh, Western leaders hoping that uh, Putin would uh, go away, well, well, they're not going to be granted uh, that wish. And, and that also likely means more war in Ukraine, because President Putin has made it clear that 
He says he's prepared to negotiate, but really only on uh, Russia's terms. And of course, uh, conversely, President Zelensky being clear that uh, he would negotiate, uh, but only on Ukraine's terms, effectively on the terms of the West, on, on, on Washington's terms and, and the terms of European capitals. So uh, there, there is... There are implications for, from this election, despite the fact that we know the results, uh, and many of them are not that positive for the West, honestly. Keir Simmons, amazing reporting. Thank you. Still ahead tonight, a father's plea. A Kentucky college student found unresponsive on the floor of her dorm room and hospitalized with serious injuries. Why her father says the school and police are not doing enough. Plus, the massive fire ripping through the L.A. mansion of model and actress Cara Delvine. The roof collapsing. We're live at the scene as details trickle in. And it could soon be impossible to get a Lyft or Uber in one major American city. Why the rideshare apps say they will stop operating in Minneapolis by May. Stay with us. We're back now with a developing story out of Los Angeles, a massive fire destroying the home of model and actress Cara Delvine. Aerial footage shows smoke billowing from the multi-million dollar mansion as the fire burned for hours. Nearly 100 firefighters were on the scene throughout this morning. The actress thankfully not there at the time. NBC Los Angeles reporter Christian Cesarares joins us now from the scene of the fire. Christian, walk us through what we know at this hour. Well, Essen, I can tell you the firefighters have been here for almost 12 hours now. Check it out. This is a live look here outside of the English model and actress's home. And you can see the fire trucks here parked right outside of the home. They are just basically cleaning up here. Now, L.A. City Fire telling us the call came for a large two-story home uh, fire around 4 o'clock this morning. But when fire crews arrived, they say they, they had a hard time finding the fire in the smoke because of the long driveway. Now, it took crews two hours to knock out this fire. They say it was an overall very extensive fire operation because of the size of the home. And as you mentioned, it took almost 100 firefighters here uh, to face this challenge. Now, uh, again, the model and the actress was not home when the fire happened. But L.A. City Fire telling us only a housekeeper was here at the home when the fire happened. And we're told she was able to walk away with uh, no major injuries here. So some good news to report yeah. there. Allison. Christian, do authorities there have any clue as to what caused this fire in the first place? Well, as of now, the cause is still under investigation, but I do want to show you a very interesting uh, piece of information that some of the neighbors were sharing with us today. I want to show you here a live look here uh, from the neighborhood. You can see that there's just so much greenery here, and their biggest concern, they tell me, is that all the properties here, they share branches. So as you can imagine, they were concerned, they were scared that this fire was easily going to be jumping from property to property here. Fortunately, that was not the case, but of course, a very scary situation here for so many neighbors. This morning. And there was a lot of concern for Kara's two cats. I mean, she posted a photo, we can show our viewers here, uh, on Instagram of her cat saying that her heart is broken. Uh, we hear there might be an update tonight about how those pets are doing. That's right. Well, we all know that our pets are part of our families, right? So, of course, she posted a picture when she thought that her two cats uh, had passed away in the fire. But I can tell you that early this morning, our crews were out here. They were able to get video of two women coming down this driveway with both of, the, of those cats in their mm -hmm. arms. And they were alive. And just a short moment after that, uh, the model going on to her Instagram and updating uh, the condition of those two cats and also going on to thanking all the firefighters and everyone in general that came out here to help. Of course, a very scary situation, uh, not just for her, but of course, for all the neighbors here in Studio City. Mm. Christian Casares in L.A., thank you so much. We appreciate it. Turning now to the mysterious incident involving a college student in Kentucky who nearly died from gruesome injuries she suffered in her dorm room. Her father now speaking out, frustrated with the lack of answers from the university and law enforcement. NBC News correspondent Elwin Lopez has this report. A father's nightmare unfolding at his alma mater, Asbury University. There's no way, you know, that these could have been caused by anything other than somebody doing something, you know, to her. These photos showing her gruesome injuries. Andy Willingham's daughter, Isabella, found unresponsive in her Kentucky dorm, rushed to the ER. 
Her father says he learned she had stopped breathing for 23 minutes. At about 11 o'clock that night, we get a call from the resident director of her dorm, and they tell, or she tells us that Bella is in an ambulance on her way to the emergency room, and that she had been found unresponsive in her dorm on the floor by her roommate. Her father says the 21-year-old student was put on a respirator, unable to breathe on her own. She wasn't released from the hospital for more than a week. But how she ended up unconscious is still a mystery. As a parent, I want to know if there's a possibility of somebody coming into the you know, school and into the campus that, that could be you know, potentially dangerous. He says he was initially told that it was believed she had fallen from her bunk bed, but her injuries seem to tell another story. The Jessamine County Sheriff's Department telling NBC News that this is, quote, an open investigation at this time. In a statement, Asbury University says it is, quote, unable to provide any updates or specific information at this time and that the school's priority remains the safety and well-being of its students, faculty and staff. Willingham speaking out now because he thinks the university has not done enough to alert students about the incident. I contacted them and I said, this is not okay. You have to send something else. You've got to give a detail so that if somebody knows something, they will be able to come forward. And uh, the school's response to me was, we feel like we've done everything we can do. And Ellison, the student's father, tells us that his wife spoke to their daughter earlier that morning that she wasn't feeling well and that she was not going to go to any of her classes. As far as we know, no charges have been filed in this case and no suspects have been named. Mm. Ellison. Elwin Lopez, thank you. When we come back, an urgent warning for pet owners in Southern California, a deadly illness affecting about a dozen dogs in Riverside County. What researchers now believe is the cause. That's next. We're back now with Top Stories news feed. Boeing is telling all airlines to check the cockpit seats on 787 Dreamliner jets after a scary incident on a flight overseas. According to the Wall Street Journal, a LATAM Airlines flight attendant hit a switch on the pilot's seat while serving a meal, causing the plane to nosedive. Luckily, the pilots regained control of the aircraft. The company issuing a memo recommending operators check for loose covers on those switch seats. And researchers in Southern California have pinpointed a parasite causing a fatal illness in pets. Experts finding the parasite in snails that live in a portion of the Colorado River that runs through Blythe. That's a city about 220 miles east of Los Angeles. Researchers say about a dozen dogs that were sickened had visited that area. Pet owners who have taken their dogs near the Colorado River in Riverside County, they are urged to get their pets tested if they begin experiencing stomach issues. And Uber and Lyft planning to stop operating in Minneapolis in Minneapolis on May 1st. Both rideshare companies saying the decision has to do with a new minimum wage law for rideshare drivers. If the bill passes, drivers would start being paid $15.57 an hour. The city's mayor has vetoed the measure, but the city council voted for an override. Lyft said in a statement the bill makes its operations, quote, unsustainable. We turn now to a shocking bullying incident in Massachusetts. Six juveniles charged after a discussion on the app Snapchat that involved, quote, heinous language, threats of violence towards people of color, and a mock slave auction. The district attorney condemning the students' actions. With this, I intend to be very clear. Hatred and racism have no place in this community. And where this behavior becomes criminal, I will ensure that we act and act with swift resolve as we did here to uncover it and bring it to the light of justice. The six students now facing charges that include interference with civil rights, threat to commit a crime and witness interference. Joining me now for more on this incident is Allison Lopez, the mother of the 13 year old student targeted and Bishop Talbert Swan. Thank you both for joining me tonight. I wish you didn't need to because this is something that should not happen to anyone. And Allison, we are so sorry for what you and your family are going through right now. But could you tell us a little bit about your daughter? How is she doing? <laughs> she's, she's struggling. She still continues to struggle. Um, 
this incident has not really um, allowed her to breathe comfortably since it first happened. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday, when the district attorney, Galuni, made his statement, it was a sort of relief for her somewhat, but at the same time, it has not been a relief. So mm -hmm. today, she still struggles. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through what happened? I mean, how did you and your daughter learn about this seemingly appalling, horrific Snapchat discussion? She woke up on Friday, February 9th, um, normal morning routine to get ready for school. And, you know, as a typical teenager, they wake up, they check their phones before their morning start to put on their music to get ready. So have you. And when she woke up, she woke up to a removal from a chat feed that she was unsure of. And the person who removed her from the chat was a name that she was not familiar with as a friend. Um, at that point, she probably asked a question to another person, and the person said, well, there was an online chat they heard that happened at night mm. that her name was part of, and it was something to do with race. Mm. And that's how it started. Um, I immediately asked her what was wrong because she came into my room really sad and crying and she said I didn't want to go to school today and I said why and she said because you know the kids are mean and I said well we're going to school because you know this is what we're supposed to do not knowing what it really was mm. and it's not until a couple hours after she arrived in the school is when I received a phone call of what exactly happened. Bishop Swan, as we mentioned, the district attorney charging these six students. But earlier this month, the Greater Springfield NAACP filed a complaint with the state against the Southwick School District where this occurred, saying mm -hmm. officials there have not properly punished the student responsible and pushing for investigations into past instances of racially charged bullying. In your mind, Bishop, are these charges from the district attorney sufficiently addressing the problem and should the school and the school district be doing more? I think the district attorney's actions are appropriate in terms of holding accountable the individuals that engage in this horrific scenario. I think the school district needs to be held accountable. Um, these incidents uh, have happened over a prolonged period of time. Once we kind of expose this particular incident regarding Ms. Lopez's daughter, uh, and the previous incidents that preceded the slave auction, we had we have had families to come out of the woodwork sharing their experiences when their children attended school in Southwick. Parents who say they left the school district, parents who say we sold our home and moved out of Southwick. Um, graduates of the school who started an online petition to hold the school district accountable, saying they experienced it while they were there, and then teachers of color who say they taught in the school district and left the school district because of racism that went unaddressed. So this is a pervasive problem in the Southwick School District, and we thought that the Department of Education needed to do some due diligence in terms of investigating whether or not they are taking proper steps to get rid of this environment that makes it so easy for these things to happen. Allison, what is your message to the students tonight who did this to your daughter? I'm sorry, I'm sad, I'm disheartened by the behavior. I am appalled. Um, I think I think the lesson, um, the message from the district attorney yesterday still has not resonated because as of yesterday, after the district attorney made his statement, they continue to be racist derogatory remarks posted on a restroom in the, mm. in one of the class in one of the um the bathrooms in the building, in the school mm -hmm. yesterday. So, you know, as of today, right now, as I sit here, um, I think there's a lot that still need to be learned and need to um, be shared with the students, with their parents and with the administration. Mm -hmm. Because as of today, the kids don't get it. The parents don't understand. Mm -hmm. You know, they feel that the, the district attorney decision is harsh, um, but at the same time, it's necessary. It's necessary. Because when my daughter came home from school yesterday, she said there was something else in the restroom. Mm. Ms. Lopez, Bishop Swan, thank you both for being with us tonight and sharing your story. We will continue to follow this. Thank you.
Coming up, a Netflix star convicted. The Squid Game actor and Golden Globe winner found guilty of sexual harassment. The sentence handed down today in a South Korean court. Back now with Top Stories Global Watch and the ongoing chaos in Haiti. New video showing black plumes of smoke billowing out of the nation's largest prison during a TV broadcast as a fire burned inside. No word on the cause of the fire or if there were any injuries. However, the prison remains nearly empty after armed gangs stormed the facility earlier this month, releasing thousands of inmates. A star of the hit Netflix show Squid Game convicted of sexual harassment in South Korea. A court official confirming 79-year-old Oh Young Soo received an eight-month suspended prison sentence and was ordered to attend 40 hours of sexual violence treatment. He was arrested in 2022 for forcibly kissing and hugging a woman. He denies the allegations and says he plans to appeal. Oh won a Golden Globe for his role as number one in Squid Game's first season. Turning now to a heartwarming story back here at home, a group of college students deciding to pay it forward in a truly remarkable way, proving that family is so often about much more than just who you're related to. NBC News correspondent George Solis has this story. So, you're about to see a man literally move to tears. We have a card for you and we also have a little gift inside. Why such a small gift warranted such a big reaction Take a listen. Love you, James. Love you, James. <laughs> the man in the video is Providence College security guard James Magaji, and this group of students love and respect for him. So genuine, it inspired them to do something not worth any grade, but certainly worth some credit. And you told us a while ago that you wanted to see your family in Nigeria that you haven't seen in a long time. Ten years, to be exact. So, when the moment came to find a way to repay the man who is not just seen as another authority figure, but rather a member of the family, the students of Raymond Hall started a fundraiser with the goal to get James back home to Nigeria to see his family, easily exceeding their original goal of $3,500. Take care of our own. That's what we do at PC. As long as I've been here, they've done that for me, done that for each other, so now we're doing it for you. Looking back and seeing the video again, what goes through your mind seeing his reverence, what you guys did for him, and being able to pay it forward in such a big way? It's just like a sense of unfathomable appreciation. I mean, James is, he, he's a hard worker. I'm glad that myself and the, the PC community and just the greater community, the greater world community was able to meet and surpass a need that that James had. To say the man in the hour was taken back is an understatement. <laughs> How did I deserve this, man? Oh, my God, guys. Oh. All I'm trying to do is to do the right thing and uh, make sure I'm doing good by you guys. And like most mentors, he took his moment to focus on those that matter to him most, all right there in that room. I pray from the bottom of my heart that uh, God will continue to protect you guys, to make sure that you achieve your goals. You can bet James will be right there alongside them because that's what family does. I think that just being able to be so blessed and also bless others, I, there's nothing better than that. And I believe that's our mission, that's our purpose while we're here on earth to use what we've given to give. George Solis, NBC News. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. I'm Ellison Barber in New York for Tom Yamas. Stay right there. More news now is on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.